Jonathan M.S. Pierce is a philosopher, author, columnist, and public speaker with an interest in writing about almost anything from skepticism to science, politics, morality, to the environment, essentially everything, because everything is philosophy. He's a former teacher and is now battling primary progressive multiple sclerosis. He can no longer play football with his twin boys, but he can write a good column and book. And remarkably, and I think in my opinion, very bravely, he's just come back from an arduous journey to Ukraine's front lines to see for himself what's going on there. His experiences are the subject of today's conversation. I'm also delighted that we'll be joined by Greg Terry, uh, you won't need an introduction because, of course, you'll have seen our interview from a couple of days ago. Um, and he was looking after uh, JP and uh, really showing him around. And it's great to have two such fantastic guests, but also first hand eyewitnesses on the channel today. Welcome. Thank you very much. And it, I'm reminded to say that there's a very fine line between bravery and stupidity. Uh, and taking a as Greg and his his charity partner Genia and my friend Pierre from a, a humanitarian organisation working out of Kramatorsk, they looked after me uh, around four thousand kilometres of the front lines, effectively, uh, and the interior also of Ukraine. And I was wondering, at very many occasions what am I doing here? You know, what is this about? Why am I here? I've got primary progressive multiple sclerosis. I'm not too good at walking. Uh, and I do need the loo quite often. And there we are driving the length of the uh, of the front lines. I'm sure this is a bad idea. But in the end, it turned out to be absolutely logistically perfect. It was an incredibly rewarding experience. It was a whistle stop tour around a good a good many places, and I got to see and experience and and things that I never thought I would otherwise, and meet many people from the military to civilian life that I never thought I would have been able to do given my condition. So hats off to Greg and Genia and Pierre, but the, they they really did look after me, and it was a, a fantastic experience. And you know, before I uh, hand back to you, that there was one thing that that was worrying me before I went and even during my time out there which is what am I doing here like what is this about is this about me is this some kind of self, sense of self-aggrandizement where I'm like look at me going on some adventure uh, I didn't want it to be that I, I'm really you know very uh, I, I, I'm critical about my own thought processes and about my own you know psychology and what's going on i'm always second guessing myself and i was, I was very I want to be very certain that this wasn't about me that, that this was about ukraine and it was about mattering but not mattering as a, as a single human uh you know mattering to other people and getting some sense of validation of who i am this was taking ukraine and do ha having my little go at bringing what's going on in Ukraine to the wider world to amplify important messages of truth and accuracy and moral clarity about what Ukraine is going through and, and to try and make, in my own little way, the world a better place through my experiences in Ukraine. So anyway. Is it also about purpose? Because you must have seen people, people either have a sense of purpose, whether that is survival or dealing with extraordinarily traumatic conditions, living in the bombed out wreckage of their cities, or you're talking to people who are in the government, in the military, but they all have purpose. They're all filling their days with some kind of structure, meaning purpose, which is the small part, a small individual part of fighting Russian aggression. Is this also part of it that you're here as an observer rather than necessarily having a direct purpose? Oh, I'm smiling because, first of all, Greg and myself. So Greg is a, a is a Republican Christian pastor from the US, right? Eugenia, his charity partner, is a, is a Christian minister from Ukraine. Pierre is a humanitarian, British humanitarian aid worker, uh, and uh, who is kind of along with me for this for this ride, if you if you like. And I'm a liberal atheist philosopher, and we've got this weird collection of people where whereby we've been thrown into a car, but actually we're united by a common purpose, right? United by a common uh, sense of um, 
well, actually, by our similarities rather than our differences, right? And that that was what's driving us. And we actually had a conversation about purpose where we're talking, I, I was advocating that everyone needs purpose just in order to have a sense of fulfillment in life. You need to be driving on to your next goal. And once you achieve your goal, it's not about realizing a goal, but it's about the journey towards a goal. And so that is that gives us a sense of fulfillment, a sense of purpose, and therefore contentment or happiness. It will help towards that. So we had that conversation in the car and actually... What's what's really interesting about Ukraine is that they are fighting for their existential. That is an existential fight. This right, they're fighting for their survival as individuals, but as a nation. You know, Russia is trying to eradicate a sense of identity. They're trying to eradicate culture and history, language, all of this from Ukraine to conform it to some sense of what I don't know what some rose-tinted idea of the Soviet Union is for Putin uh, and you get a sense that the Ukrainians very clearly know what they're fighting for. They're fighting for their friends and their family and all those things I just talked about. And yet the Russians who have been conscripted, who have been mobilized, who have been forced to go there, maybe from prison, maybe as a sense of social mobility uh, from the eastern reaches of, of Russia or whatever, don't really know what they're fighting for. And they they lack this purpose. And I think there's a, there's a really, st- I don't know the answer to your question, but there's a really stark difference between those motivations from the Russians and those motivations of the Ukrainians. And I think that speaks to a moral clarity as well. It's interesting, having had this conversation just yesterday, or the day before and published yesterday, with Rick Ukrainian, he uh, translates or he dubs... Um, interviews that are done by journalists called Zolkin with Russian prisoners of war uh, into English so they're accessible to a wider audience. And actually, the one of the key focuses there, when you get beyond the details of their capture and, uh, you know, where they're from and all this kind of stuff, one of the key ideas there is to get down to what their motivations are for coming to Ukraine to essentially kill people. They're fully aware that that's what they're being asked to do. There's no mystery about that. They may have perhaps kidded themselves into the illusion that it wasn't going to be as 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 brutal as it actually is. But there's no illusion about what they're coming to do. And in most cases, it seemed to be extremely detached from from any morality, from any real purpose beyond the chance to make some money, money which in the rest of their lives, they never would have seen that much money or had the opportunity to make much money. It's it's a really kind of quite a crude, um, extremely crude motivation. Yeah, and if you think about a hierarchy of motivations, that's going to be one of your real base level ones, which is... Uh, you know your financial gain uh, when you're comparing that to again all those ideas of what the ukrainians are fighting for it, there is this this really stark difference uh, it's interesting Rick, the ukrainian is part of this uh, i i guess collection of youtube youtubers uh, myself uh, greg Rick the Ukrainian, Professor Gerdes explains, and we all have come together to fundraise and and help raise awareness of what is going on. And actually, I met Rick the Ukrainian several times in in Kiev when we I went out, and then on the back end of the loop. And uh, he's a wonderful human being, and it's mm. it's great to work with these people who are driven by a sense of uh, of moral clarity, of of, of purpose uh, to do to make the world a better place, right? And, w- and we were delivering aid or if we weren't delivering aid and greg will talk to to you about this it's all about it's also about networking it's about everyone you meet on the front i was it, it was fascinating for me to sit and watch greg and genya at work you'd stop at a, a at a um petrol station and there'll be a unit that's just pulled up there there was this time where there was a unit from with dark black or dark blue uniforms on very uh, clean vehicle it didn't look like they're fighting on the front line who are these guys and as they're walking towards the um the petrol station you know he, i think it's great that said oh i think these guys are from kamel mitsky and that's when that's where greg that's where jenny's from that's where greg uh, and a charity is based and it's like oh this is interesting so they walked in and it, it turns out they were d miners and jenny went oh do you know this chap here and the guys went yeah that's our boss and then straight away there's this connection and then out of that those guys are going to get a a, a, my, a metal detector from greg and jenny and from from our charity work um as a collective these guys you know it took just a matter of minutes to make those connections and then for things to happen and then 10 minutes later 
Genio got me into their vehicle for a photo shoot, like I was some like ten year old kid on a on a roller coaster or something. So like thumbs up uh, in the in the front front of this uh, four wheel drive, and it was it was fantastic, phenomenal. But I was seeing this at every single place we stopped. It was networking, 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 and all part of a project to to help um, provide aid to people who desperately need it. That is the very manifestation of purpose. And that is extraordinary. It's also extremely Ukrainian, isn't it? See a problem, solve a problem. Seems to be, you know, not wait around for somebody else to deal with it. Well, not everybody, but yeah. I see you and want to talk to that. But yeah, I do, do want to talk to that. And I'm sorry, Greg hasn't said anything yet. But um, but what what's fascinating, someone like Genia particularly, I noticed that he's a guy that is incredibly adept at multitasking and has 58 things going on at once and he's contacting all these different people and getting phone calls and sorting this out but and i've seen this with with other people as well like there was the pierre's organization called base ua that's based out of kramatorsk which is run by some other guys and there's a chap called anton who i've interviewed on my youtube channel the genia and anton very similar in ways it's like it's like Okay, instead of saying, right, I'm, we're safe just delivering this kind of aid and we'll just do this over and over and over. It's always like, oh, I've met someone and they need this. How about we start doing this as well? And they meet someone else and oh, we need that. Okay, we can do that. And it's it and this because the Ukrainians need bloody everything all the time, like everything, the whole society right across like how how a society functions how a, how an economy functions how you know energy infrastructure functions how a military functions they need help with everything because they are under attack physically economically um in the information spaces and so when someone who wants to help as much as possible as greg and jenny do or as anton for base ua wants to help as much as possible and someone says we need x then you go well if i can help you get x no matter what it is I am morally obliged to do that. And that's a beautiful thing. But man, it makes life tough when, when, when the scope is almost endless. And talking to that, Greg, um, we, we talk about this extraordinary manifestation of, of civil society and at its heart networking and, you know, doing it because of a shared set of values. And, you know, this could be Muslim, atheist, uh, Jew, Orthodox, people of all sorts of different backgrounds and worldviews come and find common purpose but you're also battling other aspects of this which is not everybody thinks like this not everybody is activated into this new sort of socio-political way of behaving not everyone buys into that purpose some people i assume will just be dealing with their own personal issues and problems what's your impression uh, from all the work you do well thank you and from here forward i will have to say um, Jonathan Fink and JP, because I've got two Jonathans in here. Um, but what I would say is this, this war is horrible, it's hellacious, but it has brought us to the place where we can find out that there is much more that we agree on than we disagree on. And I believe we are at a critical point in history we're in a critical point for the future of the world. We're at a critical place with things that are um, unfolding. And it doesn't matter what corner of the globe it's in. Um, every section, every culture, every, every, every corner of this globe is struggling right now. And if we do not find common ground, then we're in much more trouble than we realize. So I believe that this war in Ukraine is being a catalyst to bring people together, to bring people from different walks of life where they feel they can really make a difference in the lives of people. And it's happening through Ukraine. And as, as Jonathan, or as JP said, rather, um, the need is overwhelming. It is over. Overwhelming. Just today, you guys know that Avdivka fell, and Avdivka would not have fallen if Ukraine would have had stuff, as JP likes to refer to it, as far as any type of way to defend the skies and any way to um, hold their positions with artillery. It didn't happen. Avdivka has fallen, and it's a very, very sad situation. Today, I'm talking to a combat medic who is saving lives there on right right on the line of Avdivka, on that first defensive line, and she messaged me and says, please, anything you can get, 
my guys are wounded. My guys are bleeding to death. My guys are hurting. We have nothing left. And of course, I will be running there as quickly as possible. Just like JP said, the need always presents itself. But we can look at that need and say, hmm, we can just ignore it or do this piece here, or do that piece there. But if we really are flexible and if we really have our our, our ears open, our eyes attentive, we find out that we can fill the exact need that is that is most important. And when that happens, that gives people that sense of purpose that that they are a part of something greater than just dropping a tourniquet. So and and I do have to say, um JP was um and I don't want to give him kudos. Anybody that thinks he would go on a grand adventure to a frontline war is an idiot. Okay, if JP's going on an adventure, he's going to Hawaii and lay on the beach. I can see that. He will, he'll stumble across the beach, but then he'll lay down. Um, <laughs> we had a good time with all of that. But JP was um, was a hero, and he made a huge impact on a lot of people's lives. And I think the same impact was made on his life. Mm. So it's really kind of you. I don't want to get too emotional, Greg. So don't don't entrap me with with an emotional moment there. But no, thanks. I really appreciate that. And and I I, I hope there was use. I hope there was um, utility for people, you know, in Ukraine and outside Ukraine. And uh, yeah, it's just to to talk to something that Greg just mentioned. I mean, I keep using the word stuff because it just covers everything this is a really easy war to win i mean it sounds quite um frivolous but it's a really very easy war for ukraine to win right they need two things they need stuff and they need boots on the ground now we can't help with boots on the ground and that is actually the most difficult part of this war is them getting mobilized troops to the front line without destroying their economy without destroying their their sense of society and community etc cetera, etc cetera. you mobilize four hundred fifty thousand people you lose them out of the economy and you also lose i don't know how many hundreds of thousands of people who run away and leave the country so that is that is zelensky's dilemma and that's why it's taken him so long to mobilize because he doesn't want that to happen but at the other on the other side of the coin you're gonna my, by goodness they need those people on the front line right and so you need to you need to do something and and soon but but for all other things in this war this is just things things that you can build is just which translates into money right and and if we had the political will, will it would be damned easy to win this war in in a kind of abstract sense like if if we gave 500 taurus missiles you know 500 storm shadow missiles if we gave 3,000 ATACMs, if we gave uh, 10,000 HIMARS missiles, if we gave uh, 100 F-16s, if we gave some Grippens with some Meteor missiles, you know, so on and so forth. It's just stuff. It's just things, right? And we can build more things as we go forward. But but we can't do anything about a, a war that's lost. Like, we can't rewind time. And so this inflection point that Greg talks about is a super important point in time. And if we look back in 50 years, 100 years time and think, oh, all we needed to give them was X number of missiles and we didn't do that, then what a waste. Sorry, and there's an example I'm, getting, to getting to, I'm getting ranty. No, but there's an example today of Denmark, which Perfect. exactly exemplifies this. Yeah. The Prime Minister of Denmark at the Munich Security Conference has said they're going to give Ukraine every single shell and every single artillery unit in their stock. They're going to clean their stocks out because they rightly recognize that Russia does not have the capacity to invade Denmark. That stuff yeah. is just sitting in a warehouse, not defending Europe. I said this at the beginning of the war. Literally, I said this a year and a half ago. It's like we designed and created all this weaponry amongst NATO for the sole purpose of defeating Soviet equipment, right? That's why it, we have it. That's what the Challenger 2 was designed for, right? And what are we doing? We, who are we going to get invaded by? There's only Russia and China, right? And China are waiting to see what happens with Russia. So the only reason we have all this equipment sitting around the world, yes, there's stuff going on in the Middle East, but broadly speaking, we are not going to be invaded. Yeah, we can keep some stuff back in case there's there's an emergency mission out elsewhere. But this stuff 
send it to Ukraine and rebuild it and improve our own armed forces. There's a, there's a bit of a double whammy there. You invest in your own manufacturing, you get your, you get your jobs going. I, I'm not advocating the industrial military complex, except I am. Like, I never thought I would do this 10 years ago. But, you know, we, we can we can build this stuff, we create jobs, we get tax revenue, and we also advertise our own equipment so that people go and buy it. Think of HIMARS being, you know, sold off the shelves now. Uh, you send it to Ukraine and then you get the better version of that that supporting your own um military strategies in your own warehouses so yeah absolutely 100 percent over to you greg well it's it's simple um you guys are 100 percent correct and if we for some reason and and i i do know part of the reason and i would never say it's all of the reason and johnny jp and i had we had so many conversations about this traveling around the front lines this this propaganda war, this informational war that has been going on, not for five years, but for decades and decades and decades has brought us to this point where, you know, I agree with you completely that this war would be easily won if they were supplied with, as you call it, Johnny, stuff. And for some reason, which I don't think anyone has put their finger on completely yet, but for some reason, the stuff is not coming. And if we think that it's just, well, it's it's going to be either reason A, B, or C, I, I don't think it's that simple personally. I, I think there is a, a complexity of ideological values that come together mm. to create this uh, deficit of what I call morality in the world, to see what is happening, to watch today people being liquidated and and wiped off this planet for no reason for for lies and what is good in the world not standing up and doing what they could easily do to stop this in a new york minute there is a fundamental problem somewhere that whether it's with philosophy or with the, you know jonathan finks expertise. I love watching him and understanding his viewpoints. We still have not put our finger complete, completely on the on the bullseye yet. We're dancing all around it, but there is some type of, of, um, of synergy that comes together with all these nations. There's some, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist at all. I hate conspiracy theories. I, I'm just saying there's something where I think the world thinks they're trying to weaken Russia or weaken these ideological values, what they're actually doing by delaying the support of Ukraine is increasing. They're increasing the the philosophy of Russia. I mean, do we realize that Navalny was killed and the world does nothing? Do we realize that, as you said, JP, it's just money and former President Donald Trump being fined in the past few days and his company's massive amounts of dollars, and he comes out the very next day pimping a golden tennis shoe with a T on the side. You see, this is the values of society. They've changed away from what is good and what is right, and it doesn't matter about background, philosophy, religion, culture, it, it is just what is morally right. And for some reason, the world is extremely screwed off of this. And unfortunately, U Ukraine is is on the short end of the stick currently. Uh, and, and this is why winning it on the Ukrainian battlefields is so important, because winning in the information spaces is contingent upon winning on the battlefields. We can't hope to defeat the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg. We can't hope to defeat the troll factories of Russia if we can't win on the battlefields. One is contingent on the other. We need a regime collapse in Russia of some sort that will that will be expedited by a win in Ukraine for the Ukrainians. And we need that in order to to, to grapple with what's going on in the information spaces. We don't have troll farms. And it kind of frustrates me that, that we look at what Russia is doing and interfering with all our elections. And I get absolutely incandescent with rage when I see Tucker Carlson spewing like actual Russian talking points and doing the job of a Russian propagandist. And I think what is going like Ronald Reagan, we turning in his grave when I see American politicians also doing this, like regurgitating Kremlin talking points in, in the Senate, like filibustering over, over a bill that's probably not what well, that Mike Johnson has then gone on a two week holiday. So he doesn't have to put through the house of representatives. And I think what, you know, what is going on here when we have people, 
uh, on our side, like acting on behalf of the uh, of the Russians. It's just incredibly frustrating. We need to. I mean, part of what I do, part of what I see that I do is fighting the good fight in the information spaces for truth and accuracy to prevail. Right. It is. It is. So in philosophy, we talk about epistemology, which is a study of knowledge and truth. And we talk about national security. We talk about cyber security. But now there's a thing of epistemic security. And epistemic security is the security of what is a fact. Like we don't know what a fact is anymore. We don't know what truth is anymore. And and that is being the, the whole landscape is being there's fog over that landscape. And that fog comes from a big old Kremlin smoke machine. And we need to we need to clear the air. Uh, and that requires winning on a battlefield and it requires working really hard in the information spaces. And we don't have the troll factories pro pro providing a positive narrative of what's going on, what, what the world is about. We don't have that ability to fight back at the moment. And I think we should be considering what we do in terms of fighting a back against troll, uh, fighting back against trolls. The last two days, sorry, I know I've spoken a lot, but Avdivka has been terrible the last couple of days for Ukraine. Although the Russians have lost phenomenal numbers, they just don't care. But it's been terrible for the Ukrainians who have fewer, the ability the less ability to to take those losses right and i have had my threads infested with russian trolls like infested and they are so active and they are out there every other person on twitter is, is a blue tick russian troll and what are we doing about that not enough and this is and an interesting question isn't it here i'm going to jump well, I, in go ahead and, and this is going to be one for both of you but you talk about truth and knowledge which may have been a guiding principle, uh, you know, in, in the old world. But what is the guiding principle now? It's narratives, it's stories. Whether those stories are good stories, it's a value judgment, or bad stories. But the stories either have a purposeless or they have a purpose. <clears throat> and whether Ukraine wins or not, whether it wins in Avdivka or not, it's going to be the person that spins the story that creates that reality after the event have we really got to grips the ideas that actually our foreign policy is not based on knowledge and rationality it is based on the stories that people tell themselves and i think the realization over the last uh, two years has been there are some incredibly weak stories that politicians and decision makers are telling themselves and they are inclining themselves to listen to tellers of stories um without questioning the motives behind those. I mean, I won't name names here, but there are clearly foreign policy experts who have a outsized influence on say the White House um, that are heavily informed by Russian narratives, whether consciously or unconsciously, whether they're doing it with malignancy or not, those stories have power and they have power to modify, change our actions, even coercive behavior so i'd have throw that to to jp and then and then greg i was frantically trying to make some notes there because I, what i wanted to say i thought uh, greg might go in first so i wanted to say that one of my biggest criticisms of biden and i'm generally going to be more pro biden than i am pro trump or pro republican in just where my politics lies but where i would criticize biden is with the with the messaging over this whole war uh, f from early doors, it took a year and a half for him to start doing the correct messaging. And this is kind of what I was talking about before with regard to, you know, the the benefits of producing weaponry and giving to Ukraine. Like the, he was relying on the moral argument. And the moral argument is clear. But once you've made that moral argument, if that hasn't convinced people, you need to use other tools in your storybook, right? In, in your writing uh, satchel, right? So you have the moral argument, as I say, it's very clear, like, Ukraine, and I really think it can be this clear. Ukraine are the good guys, Russia are the bad guys, Russia have invaded, done horrible things, committed a load of war crimes, uh, and, and generally been horrible. And they've been doing that since 2014. Yes, there's a little bit of grey area here and blah, blah, blah. And everything's a little bit nuanced. But actually, this is the clearest war, in my opinion, the clearest sort of moral calculation of any conflict we've ever seen. But if that's not convinced an awful lot of people, which it, which it it, it kind of did at the beginning and then things change in the US, then you need to use other 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 um tricks here, which is well not tricks. You need to you need to be explaining things in other ways. So you need to talk about the benefit for for attacks, uh, employment, 
sales of weaponry, uh, talking about 90% of the money being spent on Ukraine is spent within the US, if, you, if you're talking about the US. All these kind of things are so important to add to the repertoire of rationality uh, for uh, justification for helping Ukraine. So many people think that helping Ukraine with $100 million worth of aid package is taking $100 million out of a fund that was going to be spent on hospitals, right? And take that and walk across to Ukraine put it on Zelensky's desk and they say, there's $100 million of American taxpayers' money that would have been spent on hospitals. You can go and spend that on your corrupt whatever. And it's like, no, that's not what's going on. We're spending $100 million in the US. 90% of that is going to be spent in the US. We're going to be build stuff. We'll send it to Ukraine or we'll send some of our stuff to Ukraine and we spend that money on rebuilding our own armed forces. And do you not think that's a good idea? Do you not think that US should be in a better position to fight a war in future than they are now? Well, I presume you would. So therefore, you should support, you know, supporting Ukraine for all of these reasons, not just that moral reason. Sorry. Mm. And there are other stories, Money. though, just to throw this other story at you. And this is what I mean by coercive control. Russia has said, well, we, we've got nuclear weapons, you know, we're, we're a bit mad. We're going to use them. Uh, and you can query that story, but it's certainly a manufactured story that they want us to buy into. Um, then there's another story that they throw out at the same time, which is we're incredibly fragile and weak and we might fall apart. You wouldn't like that either. Well, they can't be can't be both. They can't be strong and weak at the same time. And yet these are narratives which do seem to have intermingled with the strategic calculations. And it's a form of coercive control to prevent us taking action. And it's not just the GOP stalling because they have other narratives, some of them entirely self-interested, some of them entirely concocted, but there are coercive narratives working on both sides of the aisle, mm. I would argue. Yeah. I um, shared something with JP when we were driving around Ukraine, the front lines. We had so much time to discuss, and the more time we spent together, um, Jonathan, the more we realized how similar we were. And the things that bring us together was much more important than the things that divide us. Unfortunately, I'm going to interject here. I think in listening to JP's rant there for three minutes, and I completely agree with him, completely. And he's left and I'm right. And he's atheist and I'm Christian. It doesn't matter. I completely agree with him 1 million percent. Why? Because I think we live in a society today, and I can speak for my own country. You guys can speak for yours. I do not know the exact statistic, nor probably does anybody. But we live in a generation right now where most people have no idea have any understanding about government, have any understanding about civic responsibility, have no understand. I would venture to say that 50% of American citizens could not even point Ukraine out on the map. I, I'm, I'm being very, very honest with you guys. And that's my own country and I can talk about it. In 1984, I shared this video clip with J JP. There was a, a gentleman who was former KGB he was in the Soviet Union. His name is Yuri Bezmenov. And I'm sure, Jonathan Fink, you've heard of him. But this guy nailed it in 1984. And he told the United States at that time exactly what is happening in our nation. Now, guys, we are 40 years later from that. And this guy, Yuri Bezmenov, basically stated that Russia that time, the Soviet Union has been working not only in the United States, but working around the world to bring an ideological change to the globe. And he broke it down into four steps of subversion, he called it ideological subversion, KGB strategy. The first one is to demoralize. You, you demoralize an entire generation or two into ideology, into Marxist ideology. And over time, this becomes normal for people. He says the second phase of Basically, overthrowing a government or overthrowing uh, a movement without even firing a shot is you then destabilize it. And that's through economic, which we're seeing now, foreign relations, which we're seeing now, and defense systems. Spot on. He says, then we manufacture crisis. 
Now, if we look back through history, it could be different crises that have happened around the world that Russia right now is right in the middle of. And then finally, he said, the fourth step you will see will be normalization. And this is the point that I want to make with what Johnny said. Normalization is where you look at what is happening in the world. And instead of responding to it as, let's make it simple, that is not normal to level Avdivka, to level Bakhmut, to commit acts of genocide. And we're just speaking about Ukraine here, not any other place on the planet right now. But it becomes normalized for society to the point that you could literally take people and show them, and they still would struggle to believe it. I interject this one story um, that I think will be beneficial here. The first time I came and was running aid on the front lines, I've been working in Ukraine 26 years. I've spent now almost four years of my life inside Ukraine. And I know Ukraine very well. But the first time when the war broke out and I said, okay, I've got to go. I've got to go and help my guys because they would do the same for me. And I came here and started running aid to the front lines. A friend of mine who owns a, um, a defense group kind of... They rescue human trafficking all over the world. They're, they're covert operatives, and they're based out of Georgia. He called me. He says, Greg, I'm going to send a guy with you at my own expense, my company's expense, because I'm concerned, because I know I can't stop you from going. So I'm going to send a guy who's very experienced, um, uh, special forces, U.S., multiple tours of duty in, in uh, the Middle East, Pakistan. He runs security for U.S. senators, and I'm going to send him at my own, my own cost just to get, have your back. I said, great. Okay, I don't think I need him, but great. So he came, nice chap, as you guys would say, nice chap. And um, I took him, Johnny, just like you. He went right with me. He sat right where Pierre sat. Um, he was a wonderful person. But as we're riding around, he would have conversations with us like this. Guys, I'm here to take care of you. But do you think you could show me the bio labs? Because I know they're here. Now, listen, I'm not making this up, guys. Greg, just show them to me. I know you're here to help Ukrainian people because you love them, but they're here. And I, I said, man, you, you, you're believing a lie. You're believing a lie. And this guy ran with us. And Johnny, the first time a missile fired, we were in Kramatorsk. And we had a cruise missile come right over our head. He called the guys in Georgia and instead of staying with me for six weeks, he left in three weeks because he was scared of a missile. And I said, man, I thought you were Rambo. I said, John, now it would be Johnny Pierce is much more Rambo than you are. The point being, I fast forward ahead. This guy was on a television program about 45 days ago in the state of Georgia, and he was being interviewed about his time on the front line because the organization he works for is very well known in the United States. And they were asking him about the war and, and about his ability that he was able to go. And he never mentioned names. He just said, I was with an American. I was with the Ukrainian. I was security for them as they were delivering aid. And they did an amazing job. And I support them. And then the, the, the person doing the interview asked him, well, what are your observations as an American military, special forces, decorated hero. And he looked right at that camera after I had taken him to the front line and says, I've seen it all. Russia is killing them. Russia is destroying it. But there's something wrong because if I had to choose today which side I support, I don't know what my answer would be. I was not there to support Ukraine I was there to make sure Greg came back alive. That was my job. But for me, I don't know which side I'd support. And guys, I took him right to the front. That's and, the and problem. This goes to the experience that, that was happened right throughout the war. And I spoke to people in Ukraine while I was out there about their experiences of relatives out in um out back in Russia. And we, we heard so many stories, particularly at the beginning of the war, where the, the people from Ukraine would phone their relatives saying, my, my town has been bombed. And then their relatives wouldn't believe them. And they prefer to believe state media over their own kind of kin's primary source evidence. And it, it's incredible. And the power of you know, psychology and our psyches, we, we are you know, the easiest person to fool is ourselves. And, and that, that Greg's story there is a 
really telling example of people's power to want to believe what they want to believe like that that desire to believe a conclusion can override evidence against that conclusion it's you know motivated reasoning whatever it is that the people end up believing nonsense even in certain cases in in greg's example there of experiencing those things firsthand i went uh, sorry just finally i i met a a commander of a unit up in the sumi region it's, it's your, my first day after getting to uh, to ukraine we we whisked ourselves up to sumi uh snow everywhere and we had to be very quiet that night you, you know we we were next to the border and we were staying in a sort of guest house that would normally be operating for tourists who's seeing the beautiful countryside around Sumi, but is just close to the border. And if they know that people are accumulating in a certain place, there are drones about, then they'll hit that place. So we had to be really careful. We're inside kind of very low lights uh, and very quiet that night. And then the next day, we sort of nipped out to a house nearby that was within drone, within mortar, within artillery range, right? So this was one of the most dangerous experiences I had out there, apart from Kherson, where you had like explosions going on all over the shop. But, but there, the commander of the unit had parents who uh, were ill he's been fighting his brother lived in russia uh, and his parents were um disabled and at the beginning of the war he had to get his parents he was unable to look after his parents so he got his parents shipped off to russia to stay with the brother in the hope that you know their first hand experiences of the war would maybe you know teach enlighten the brother somewhat who was who was you know, even I presume Ukrainian, but but just hook, line, and sinker was believing the Russian narratives. I think Greg, you're saying that was a that was a term he used, like hook, line, and sinker. And even with his parents staying with him and the experience of the brother fighting in Ukraine against the Russians, that guy, that guy's brother in Russia was still totally pro-Russian in his views. And it's like, what does it take? It's so and, frustrating. And JP, remember, remember where they were from they had seen the hell of the hell of the war Bakhmut. they were from bakhmut yeah sorry i forgot that vital 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 piece of information yeah. not from lviv from bakhmut yeah yeah and, and so this, yeah. yeah this sorry, is one John. of the most sinister i think but most effective of the russian propaganda narratives which is that ukrainians and russians are the same people that there's no difference, and that in some way this is a civil war. That one seems to really cut through, unfortunately. Um, it Not so much in the UK. I don't think that many people sort of quite fall for that one, although they don't perhaps understand how different uh, Ukrainian culture, mindset, language actually is, but they don't quite fall for it. This one really does seem to unfortunately cut through uh, in, in other parts of the world, those places which you know, are on the fence uh, or benefiting from Russian oil and in some quarters in the US seem to cut through as well. Why do you think this is so effective when it's so demonstrably disprovable? Well, the problem is it's, it's critical thinking. People people aren't trained in critical mm -hmm. thinking enough. And you've got here, that's it's pretty much circular reasoning, which is you're assuming the conclusion you kind of uh, end up trying to argue towards, which is to have a civil war is to assume that the place is one nation. So to claim it's a civil war is already to accept what is not true, which is that Ukraine is part of the the larger Russian, like Soviet Union or whatever. And oh, yeah, it's just a civil war with just brothers. No, no, no. You you can't just assume that and then use that to then take your argument further because actually completely disagree with what, where you're what you're assuming at the beginning there. And and so this is an invalid argument. So stuff like that. And you know, it's the idea. That, that oh they speak Russian therefore they're Russian well Americans speak English and do you know what I ain't going to go around there and try and invade them and say that they're Did part I hear of the eight? empire <laughs> yeah 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 you, you've been rubbing off on me there mate but uh, sorry I'm just not going to do that so uh, it's just you know these are just false just terribly bad arguments that 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 shouldn't stand up to to any kind of decent half decent scrutiny but they they unfortunately pervade and we're constantly fighting these kind of narratives and 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 it again it goes back to the russians peddling that i mean these arguments are still being uh promulgated uh, on on threads like you know youtube threads twitter threads and and facebook and so on and and we're just consistently fighting against this jonathan and jp let me interject one thing here and this will be interesting for jonathan fink hey for those of you that are enjoying this conversation 
um, listening to the to Jonathan's. You ought to try to be the third guy on here, and both guys are named Jonathan. It, it's hard to keep yourself straight here, but Jonathan speaks Russian, okay? Jonathan Fink. Yeah. Yes, uh, Muhatin. Okay, so if we want to, we can just win. I'm speaking to you in Ukrainian now. Sorry, it's I'm not going to the pub. Actually, if that's all right, I've got things. No, to no, do. no. The point being, I did that on purpose to make a point. JP, you're telling the story of a family out of Bakhmut. You have a son who is a commander. You have parents who would be in their mid to late 60s, probably early 70s. You have the brother, who's from Bakhmut, who left in 2014 and went to Russia. And you ask yourself, how can the one brother, whose native schooling language growing up in Bakhmut was Russian, and of course he speaks Ukrainian as well, and is a commander in the Ukrainian army, fighting for freedom his brother is in russia hook line and sinker believing all the propaganda and his parents the safest place to get them was to the brother because this other son is a, is a military commander which i i understand that completely taking care of your parents and they're on the fence but have you thought about this they grew up in the soviet union they speak the Russian language. They have seen the effects of the Soviet Union, especially the parents. And even those brothers at that age would have grown up in the later parts of the Soviet Union. And three-fourths of that family still believes it. Now, we're trying to convince a globe that doesn't speak the Russian language, that has no memory, no history of seeing things that unfold in the Soviet Union other than maybe on a movie, or maybe they've studied a little bit somewhere, but highly doubtful. And we're trying to bring truth to those guys. How difficult is that when those that grew up in it are struggling with truth? And, and when it's you not see just those... nostalgia. I say, it's not just nostalgia. They also have a sense of fear. So if they think the Soviet Union is back, there'll be certain parts of their youth that they will look back to with nostalgia, but they'll also know how pervasive and mm -hmm. powerful that system was. Uh, it's quite debilitating, I think. Yeah, it's, just, it's, it's a complicated situation. It's very complicated. Just what, what what's depressing, uh, so much of this is depressing, is that... You know, you look at, at Russia, who claim to be, you know, liberating Ukraine. And then you, I mean, I've been to some of these places, I've not been to Mariupol, but we all know the stories of Mariupol and what they've done to that and how they destroyed it. We've all seen the, the images of Bakhmut and now Avdivka. You know, their idea of liberating somewhere is just destroying it. And, and a, a stark contrast between the two sides is when Russia, scare quotes, liberated um, Kherson. They were met with kind of protest, old people in the streets standing in front of tanks. You know, you know this was this was not cool. We, we, we don't want you here. Yes, there are collaborators. Yes, there are people with pro-Russian sentiments in Kherson, of course, uh, as, as with many of these places. But by and large, they the Ukrainians did not want the Russians there. And when the Russians were liber were kicked out of Kherson, when Kherson was properly liberated, the euphoria was on show quite clearly. And you had you had Zelensky turning up there and people going absolutely nuts. And it was it's so sad to see now what Russia have reduced Kherson to months and months later, which is a, a place that is a ghost town. It's shuttered, it's board, boarded up with chipboard over the windows. You've got pop marks on the street from consistent mortar and, and artillery fire. You've got uh, you've got no interestingly when we were driving around now i didn't see a single child myself not a child there are people in kherson is still inhabited but broadly by um adults and and by people always with these frontline towns it's a vulnerable physically mentally uh lack of family lack of 
potential outside lack of, lack of prospects in life that, that stay in these places till the bitter end and uh, but Kherson's not quite there yet but it's on the way it's this almost it's this Greek tragedy of a place this this place in terminal decline that's so so sad and I think it's it, it really is reflective of of who Russia are and so like do you really care about Kherson because you are destroying it in the same way that you've destroyed all these other places you don't care one iota about these people about this culture this is not about any of those things this is about naked aggression and imperialism and uh narcissistic dictatorial ambitions from a from a dictator and revenge JP, pure yeah, revenge and, as well mm. jp since i took you there you, you can we've talked to you about bakhmut we've talked about you uh, avdivka and then her but you personally with your own eyeballs and your own emotion witnessed the liberation of Azum. What did that look like? So, uh, goodness me. So we went to a, a, a building in Izum, which was uh, destroyed by tank fire. So this wasn't an accidental missile that had that gone off course or air defense had taken down. This building had been destroyed in the middle of the, by tank fire. It's a really evocative. I wrote an article uh, cons- that, that also included this and, great picture that Pierre took of this climbing frame that was pictured between the, the, the two ends of the building. And it's almost like this child, like innocence surrounded by, the, yeah, it's just a wonderful picture. But, you know, that building that the Russians knew had uh, Ukrainians cowering in a basement in, you know, who were, who were you know, flags out saying, no, sorry, we, you know, we're here, please don't kill us. And they purposefully destroyed the building and 52, I think out of 55 people mm-hmm. perished in that basement. And, you know, we went there and saw that and we saw the memorial to, to this and not hugely reported in, in the media. This is one of those as many, there are many, many stories similar to this, no doubt, where just naked aggression has ended the lives of, of so many innocent people. And you're thinking, is this liberation? Is, is this who are the good guys? Like, it's definitely not Russia. And this, this just adds to my moral clarity. I came away from my experience in Ukraine, entirely validated in all my beliefs that I had beforehand. And it's not that I went there to validate that. It wasn't like I was searching out evidence to support my preconceived conclusions. It's just staring you in the face. It is around every corner. It's in every town. And it's obvious you know, what is going on there. I wrote an article about my experiences in Kherson, actually, for Only Sky. And I, I was absolutely, I've got, you know, followers on my YouTube channel from all walks of life, but there's a, a few of them who are um, Canadian, living in Canada at the moment, they're Ukrainians. Um, and uh, Mark and Olena, and Olena's parents live in a village called Snirivka near Kherson that we visited them and we were welcomed in with beautiful hospitality. And it was an absolutely tremendous experience. Um, but I wrote this article about my experience with Kherson, about this city in terminal decline. And I received a beautiful email back from Olena, like talking to like, this is a place that she, you know, went and studied at, at the university there or the college there or something and and had experienced Kherson. And, and you know, Mark sent me a, a, a message saying that when, when Kherson was liberated and people on the streets were celebrating, my wife was instead filled with sadness, knowing that the city where she once studied and worked would soon be bombed into oblivion, which is something that's happening now, right? And he, and he says, look, this is an incredibly moving article, very kind of him. It moved on and to tears thank you and you know when it talked about like what's my job in ukraine what's my job just in general now it's trying to uh write or, or do video content that explains the reality of what's going on so that people have an accurate representation but also moves people hopefully uh, not not in an emotional sense but in a well any kind of emotion whether it's rage or sadness or frustration but moves people to do something about the terrible situation in Ukraine because it's to the benefit of us all you know we are interconnected in this global world now in ways that are so complex that you start pulling the thread over here and it will affect people over over there and that's what's happening in ukraine there is there is no way that you can isolate ukraine from the rest of the world and think a war there is not going to affect us all it will for so many many reasons and that was going to be my last question to both of you i mean uh you, you you've been there you've immersed yourself in, in 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 that extraordinary experience and seeing what's happening and you've come back and you write about it 
I wasn't nearly as adventurous, although I will be going to Ukraine again. But I went to Lviv. But even there, you do get that sense uh, of um, the proximity of that aggression. And of course, Greg, you know, your your extraordinary work there exposes you to far more. When you come out, do you get that sense that it is local, regional, or do you carry with you the existential threat? Do you see it as you know the Russian world and all of its malignancy, hate, envy, and destruction? Do you carry that with you and see that as an existential threat that goes far beyond Ukraine's borders? And this in the last couple of minutes is a question for both of you. Well, let me answer first, and then JB can finish it off with that golden uh, voice there with that accent. I'll put the redneck ain't on you. Absolutely. One of the things that I have benefit to um, Jonathan Fink is I do travel a lot. I work in 38 nations, although, of course, the majority of my work now is in Ukraine and will be until victory. And that is how I stand. I'm not fighting a war to lose it. I'm fighting a war and helping these guys to win it because it's not fighting. This is going to answer your question right here, and then I'll expound for one minute. They're fighting for my children. So there's your answer. They're fighting for my children. I've had the benefit of being in D.C. on some meetings that I was invited to where the senators in the House of Reps guys who do get it looked right at us and looked right at the Ukrainian delegation and the ambassador and the military representatives and said, this is a global war. We're fighting the Russians massively in our nation and nobody knows about it. And nobody wants to step up to the plate and call it for what it is. And you guys are standing for the entire world. I see it everywhere. I see it massively throughout the continent of Africa. Jonathan, I do a lot of work in Africa. And I'm telling you right now that Russia and China are ruling Africa. They are preparing. They're playing the long game. I call it the, you know, Shock Matisse. And these guys, <laughs> the world needs to rethink their chess strategy because yes this is when i leave and i'll go home early part of april reset see my family and then i'll be back um i do not leave a regional conflict in ukraine or fighting a global war everywhere i go that's the the best answer i can give you yeah, and I, I go back to talk about sort of information and influence i think you know russian influence is is a i guess this virulent disease that's spreading its gangrene insidiously throughout uh, our globe and in, into our nations and, and into our heads. I mean, we're literally fighting this this war with Russia inside our heads as much as on the battlefields. And, and we need the tools to, to fight that. And I don't think we've thought enough about this, again, this sense of epistemic security about how we as nations fight back against uh, this. It, you know, China are looking on with interest. And in fact, they are also getting heavily involved, apparently, in information warfare throughout the world. And and this is this is an inflection point in time where where, I, you know, I come back and, and I and I see this as as the single most important uh, thing in the world, which is why I'm so obsessed with it, because th there is nothing more important, I think, to our security. I, I would add, you know, climate change and things like that as, as, as well. But this is something that that we can that we this is so in our faces and, and happening there and it's so morally clear uh, and will have a tangible effect and has been having a tangible effect on our democracies and our democratic institutions and mechanisms and and our our thinking over the last 10 years you know we can go back to the 2016 election we can go back to the brexit election we can go to the 2020 election and we can go to 2024 which is a year with the biggest number of elections in human history and we can say that we know that there are fingerprints of the Russians all over that. And we know they are sown discord uh, amongst particularly European um, elections uh, and, and within those countries, Serbia, Hungary, you know, Poland, all, all over France, Marine Le Pen. Uh, there, there is just everywhere there are Russian fingerprints. Uh, there's evidence of Russian interference and it is incredibly worrying. And, and th th this can be this can be focused in on Ukraine at the moment. And, and as I say, we need to we need to succeed here in order to, to, to start tackling all these other big issues with Russian influence. And I think focusing on China, focusing on how those messages and influence are spreading around the world. I mean, that is 
an area which I certainly want to broaden the channel out into um, mm. and get a whole new class of trolls uh, <laughs> tackling it as well. But I think it's important to to spread that. Now, we could talk for hours. I hope we get the chance to talk again on this theme, and especially the three of us. I think this is a fantastic dynamic. Yeah. At this point, I'm going to have to jump off uh, to join another stream, and I know you have you guys have got uh, other, other stuff you need to get to as well. But this was absolutely thrilling to hear your experiences in Ukraine, and I am quite literally in awe of the sort of courage uh, uh, and and commitment um, that, that, that really, you know, you had to put in to make that extraordinary trip. Um, but thank you both for explaining that to our audience today. Thank you, Jonathan. Well, yeah. And thank you, Jonathan. And really, you know, that, uh, that I, I don't see it as courage, uh, but I see what Greg does on a, on a daily basis and Genia, hugely courageous. And I applaud them, you know, all day long. So, well, you know, let me, let me them. make this one statement. Um, I'm, I'm an American, but I'm basically half Ukrainian now and accepted here. Um, so let me say to you two from the Ukrainians, thank you. Thank you for supporting truth. Thank you for supporting Ukraine. You do not have to, but you choose to. And I can tell you firsthand, everybody here is deeply grateful and eternally grateful. So thank you to the two Jonathans. And I have thank many you. stories about that gratitude that I would share again with Jonathan Fink in the future. But but thanks, Greg, and Slava Ukraini. Good on, Slava. Good on, Slava. And we'll put links. We'll put links in the description. Please do follow both uh, JP uh, and Greg Terry's channels. Extraordinary work there, and it will really help you understand the situation on the ground. Thank you both. Goodbye. Peace.